Okay, give a little overview. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words, and I do ask you to help us to be faithful to your words. Help us to uh, see um, see uh, what the, the, this sermon is saying. And it's about the vanity of life. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand these words in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just thinking of that, praying about that. The theme of this letter or this book is vanity of life. Okay, the vanity of life. Okay, let's say you get good in basketball and you get up to the top. You know what you're going to find out? It's vain. Pete Maravich has the uh, points record per game through college, 44 points per game two years in a row. His dad was such a fanatic about this sport, that's all he talked about, and his mom died a drunk because his dad loved basketball than his mom. And she died a terrible death. And Pete Maravich um, quit basketball, retired from basketball about 33 years old, very young. He was, he was played for the Celtics at that time when Bird came in. And he retired, and they asked him why he retired, and he said, because I don't want to die of a heart attack of 40. In that span, he got saved. He got saved in there. And he started going around giving his testimony. And, of course, he was kind of on the evangelical persuasion, because that's usually it kind of, you know, quickly adopts somebody like that, got saved. And, and he was 40 years old, playing three-on-three basketball with James Dobson and died over a heart attack. Okay, and I'll bet you if you talk to him today that he'll tell you the last years of his life being saved was much more important than his years playing basketball because of the vanity and the trouble he got in. (laughs) But uh, I know Pete Maravich is before any of, you know, a lot of your time, but get on YouTube, you can see some clips. Uh, But uh, Ecclesiastes is a sermon for Americans. It's about the vanity of life. If you look at life from under the sun only, okay, and that's what it's about. Okay, if you look at the title of the book, Ecclesiastes, drop the last four letters. Does anybody know what that is? If you're a Greekifier. Anybody know what that is, Joe? Okay, that's, here's what's funny about this. Okay, that's a transliterated way of writing the Greek word, and it's ekklesia. And the Greek of fires would tell you uh, another rendering of that is assembly or church. But you know what's funny about that? Is what language did they say the Old Testament was written in? Hebrew. And we got within a title, ekklesia. Okay, and they happen to get that one right. Okay, some of them, Greek definitions are right, but a lot of them are wrong. James Strong is not to be trusted in his Greek words at the back of the Strong Concordance. Okay, so uh, if you see the title, it says Ecle- uh, Ecclesiastes or the Preacher. Okay, so this is the fourth book of the wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. So the word preacher... It's found seven times in this book, amazingly. The coincidences of God are phenomenal. Okay, and this is, this is what's uh, called in the uh, Bible schools the art of preaching or homiletics. The Catholics will call it a homily. A homily. Okay, that's the art of preaching or the art of teaching. A homily or homiletics. And so... If you go to Bible school, they'll have a class, it will be called homiletics, and then the guys will preach at each other, okay, and they're trying to learn how to preach, okay, and depending on the college, depending on the style, you ever see the ones down in Kentucky where they get going in a rhythm, in a rhythm, and I'm here to hell, I've been telling you, and then they'll get a little spit right in here, you know, and then they got to have a hanky, you know, wipe it off, 
And then you can see the guy on both sides of the, ser- uh, the pulpit. I mean, that's a certain style. Okay? And sometimes that's a spirit. Okay, where a guy would say, baptism. Okay, you're dealing with uh, Campbellite, because they say it in a certain fashion. So, homiletics is the art of preaching. The art of writing a sermon is called hermeneutics. That's what they use. And it's funny how they, why they use that word. Hermes is a pagan god. And what's happened in the church is the pagan Greek uh, philosophy has infiltrated the Greek and Hebrew lexicons, and this is what the pastors and preachers and professors go to to study. And what are they getting? They're getting information from pagan, lost Greek philosophy. And that's how they're preaching to their people. Okay, and that's why I'm not a Greekifier. Okay, and even King James guys will run to the strongest accordance, think they're an expert, and then they're run, and what they're doing is they're getting definitions of the NIV, New American Standard. Of course, they'll never read that in their pulpits, but that's what they're getting because they don't believe the book in their hands is the Word of God. So Ecclesiastes, or the word preacher, as in this one, it's found seven times. For some reason, he has an uppercase P for it throughout there. And Solomon is a guy doing the preaching. So, Ecclesiastes shows how to preach. Okay, that's what it does. The first lesson I ever taught publicly, I went to the sword of the Lord, got a three-point outline, and waited for some kids to get off the bus out of Hammond. And I got two guys that were from Laos, they couldn't even speak English. So I sat the whole time, Jesus, God, Jesus, heaven, Jesus. (laughs) That was my first class. Okay, absolutely knew nothing. Not a thing. Okay, the second week, I think they all spoke Spanish. And one thing, one time up in Hammond, we had a Sunday school contest, and this contest was, what's my name? And if the kid, remember that contest, Jen? The kid, if, the, if the young kid came up to you and said, what's my name? And we didn't know the name, we had to give him a penny. But if we asked them what their name was, then we got out of that. So it got everybody going around asking everybody's name. And one little uh, Mexican came up to me and said, what's my name? And I thought, oh, stink, I don't remember his name. And I said, Angel. I mean, Angel, Jose, Juan, you got a one in three chance. And he says, I didn't think you'd ever remember. I thought, oh, yeah, I remembered. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, as, far as, as far as these, uh, the, here in this story of uh, Ecclesiastes, this is a sermon put out by the preacher. I remember up there in uh, Spanish, in the youth department, we worked up there. Uh, Eddie Lapina is up there now. I remember hearing his first sermon with the young people. He, man, he, he, he couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. But, uh, hey, you got to start somewhere. you got to start somewhere, and whenever you say words about the Bible, you're never wasting your time. Never are. Okay, so... Solomon is a guy that's totally qualified. He's, he is giving a perfect sermon, okay, from a perfect preacher. Now, obviously, the word perfect does not mean sinless. It means complete or well-rounded, okay, and it's a mature thing. And the word preacher, you find it seven times in the book. You'll see it in chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. 1 verse 2, saith the preacher. Okay, 1 verse 12, I the preacher. Chapter 7 verse 27. He says, Behold, thus have, this have I found, saith the preacher. There is not an uppercase P. Chapter 12, verse 8. <clears throat> vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vain. Verse 10. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And then what is the preacher doing in verse 11? Uh, masters of assembly. So a preacher is given a, a message in an assembly. Okay, and what's the preacher supposed to do? What's his most important thing? Verse 9. 
Okay, a lot of, there are some preachers that are good pulpiteers. Okay, uh, I watched Jack Hiles. That guy, from his speaking ability, using the microphone, can move masses of people. And so could Adolf Hitler. Okay, and, but if you, if you would hear Jack Hiles preach, you, he would take one little truth and he'd hit it from this angle and 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 this angle. And, this angle. and by the time you got done, I got that in about five minutes. And he would preach about 25 topics. His son-in-law gave the topics, and that's what he did continually. Okay, he wasn't a, a Bible teacher per se, but he was a preacher. Okay, he was a pulpiteer. He could move people by, his, by the closeness to the microphone. See, I'm, you know, the microphone's here. He would use, not Lowe's mic, but a mic, and he'd have his lips about one inch from the mic. And there's a reason for that. That's what rock stars do do. And there's a reason for that, because the person feels as close to you as you are to the microphone. Could be good, could be good, could be bad. Okay, but uh, R.G. Lee was known to be a good pulpiteer. Okay, but that doesn't mean they're a good Bible student or anything. I'd say being a good Bible student is better. But a preacher's job or his primary calling is in verse 9. Moreover, because a preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails. That's why you get the point. Fastened by the massive assemblies which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end and much study is the weariness of the flesh. So the preacher's number one job is to study. All sorts of studying, all sorts of studying. Solomon was such a wise uh, man as far as knowledge. He could study, he could talk on botany and be the expert. He can talk on animals and be the expert. He can talk about music and he would be the expert. I mean, he'd talk about these things. Okay, the three areas I probably focus on more than anything is doctrine, law, that one I've kind of not as much anymore, but health. Physical health. Okay, there are some things that I'm going to start be putting in the bulletin that a person can do. Old, these are older remedies, but they are remedies that work. You know, apple cider vinegar, blackstrap molasses, honey, and cinnamon. Honey is great for healing of wounds. Okay, burned wounds, things like that. Uh, now the hospitals are starting. You ever see medicinal honey in hospital? Now they're starting to come around to that. Okay, and so I'm, I'd like to give some of those things uh, because they're so beneficial for the body. But one of the greatest things to do is continue to exercise. Continue to exercise. Keep the body moving somehow, some way. Uh, any of us knows that if your blood's not circulating, Brother Rick was telling me this about the blood in his leg and how the trouble he has because the blood of his body's not getting through his leg to help him. And then he said, you know, that's just like the blood of Jesus getting in our lives too, isn't it? I said, that's right. Same thing. Okay, and so uh, the preacher is found seven times in here. Uh, He is to study. That's what he's supposed to do. The preacher must study. If you go to what Paul told Timothy, let's try him. 1 Timothy chapter... Remember that Timothy was a fellow that Paul had uh, won to Christ. And Timothy became a, a pastor or a bishop. And so this is his advice to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, <clears throat> giving heed to seducing, devils and, uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, now that's the eight. We are in that period. Okay, especially, more so than that, with these cell phones, you have to access some of the most wicked things. Okay, now, Internet's got a lot of benefits. If you don't know how to change brakes in a car, type in brakes, car model, and then you can go to the barn and do it. <laughs> okay, but uh, 
You, it, it can be a benefit, but it also can be a detriment. Now, what's going to determine it is your heart. It's going to be your heart. Okay, and so be aware of these things. And so this one says, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. In the latter times, that's where we're at. And verse 16 of the same chapter. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Save thyself from what? From verse 1. The de deception and doctrine. Okay, same letter. Next chapter, chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Second Timothy 2, verse uh, 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then that soldier, down in verse 15, is to be a student. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That verse is changed in every new Bible, even in New King Jimmy. They take the word study out. Most of them take rightly divide out. The New King Jimmy leaves it in. Okay, but that right there is the primary thing for a preacher. Okay, or to, to study the word. Okay, chapter uh, 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, <clears throat> which are able to make thee wise in a salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And then there's the definition, comma, truly furnished unto all good works. So there's, it's actually defining. Okay, the art of preaching or writing sermons is called homiletics, and it's getting harder and harder all the time in this TV age. Okay, if you study, if you study TV, study the art of television in that, watch how the TV screen will be shifting every two seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds. And the reason why that is, is because Americans don't have an attention span anymore. Okay, and the rule of thumb is that you remember 11% of what you hear, 80% of what you see. That's why you remember somebody's face. You don't remember their name. And that's why I would encourage you to have a Bible in front of you and a pen so that you can take notes because you're using your eye gates and your hand, your touch, and you're writing things down and you're seeing, if you're a sight learner like myself, a sight learner, then you remember more that way. Uh, when I went through school, I, I rarely had to study outside of class because I was so focused and concentrated on the teacher that when I studied outside of class, it was just a quick review and usually before a test, everybody would be cramming, and I'd just be sitting there listening to everybody cramming. And I'd often get a couple, oh, okay, I'll, I'll get, remember that, and I'd get the, the answer right. But the idea, a lot of times we do things over because we don't pay attention the first time. We don't concentrate. And that's one thing about sports. It teaches you to focus. Okay, it teaches you to focus where you can concentrate even though all the distractions are outside. And sports definitely shows weaknesses in your flesh more than anything you're going to find. So just like everything, sports has a good aspect and a bad aspect. But one thing about sports, if you're going to be good at it, you learn to focus to ignore all the distractions. Okay, you ever see a, a guy, you got 15 seconds on the clock, a basketball, he's got the ball at the other end, and some guy, he gets the ball and he throws up a wild shot at half court, and there's eight seconds left in the clock. He's not focused, he's panicked. 
You can take a basketball from the free throw line and dribble down in less than five seconds and shoot a good shot, no problem. No, no time left in a shot. No time left in a clock. And the other team goes home crying. <laughs> okay, I like this one play where <clears throat> Larry Bird, and of course I'm you know, kind of dating myself, and of course Larry Bird was a hick from French Lick. And there were like uh, eight seconds left in the clock, and this black guy was guarding Larry Bird. Some of you know this story. And he told the black guy before the timeout, he said, I'm going to get the ball, and I'm going to shoot it right here in your face. And that guy said, I know, and I'm going to be ready. And timeout, ball went right to Bird. He got it right there. He shot it right in his face, and a second guy was coming up trying to block it, and, a, and he made it, and the black guy goes, man. And Bird says, I didn't, leave the, I didn't mean to leave two seconds on the clock. I mean, that was just somebody who knew the game. Obviously, he shot eight, 900 shots a day through the summer is what he did. A guy loved the sport, but what's that going to do for him in heaven? He probably ain't going to get there from his life's pattern. He had a very difficult life. His, di- his dad died a suicide. So there's a lot of heartaches in these people, a lot of heartaches that people don't see. And that's where Solomon's taken us. In chapter 1, verse 1, Solomon has a theme. The theme is, life is vain. Life is vain if you limit it to under the sun. Okay, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 1. He starts off with his theme, theme. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Okay, the phrase under the sun or under heaven, 29 times in 12 chapters. That's on the average two and a half times per chapter. So Solomon is looking at life from life's perspective, and he said it's vain. Jan and I went to Switzerland years ago. I think it's for our 25th. But uh, we went to a place with Nico Vierhoof. Went up on this, this high, uh, precipice. Looked over the whole city. And it was a straight shot down. I mean, you could look straight down. I don't know how many feet, but hundreds of feet. And my thought was, wow, this is a place somebody can commit suicide. Not that I had a desire, but I, that's what I thought. And Nico says, That's why we put the fence here. He said, probably on a weekly basis, somebody goes up there. Why? They're looking at life from under the sun. If you look at life from under the sun, what's the use? What's the use? Okay, and so that's what Solomon is saying. That's his theme. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's the doctrinal theme. Verse 9, same chapter. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. We learn from history that men seldom learn from history. And that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. How do you know the future? You know the future by studying the past. America is doing the same thing Israel did, Judah did, Babylon did, Greece, Media, Persia, and Rome. Same thing. Okay, and so you know that just by reading the past. Verse 10, it says, Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new, it hath been already of old time, which is before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come hereafter. So life is is vanity if you limit it to the world. And this is what the hedonists have said for years. Okay? And if you look at Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all the guys talk about them, they were pikers compared to Solomon. Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, had over 300 some wives, 700 concubines, or vice versa, I forget which. And in chapter 7... He says, among a thousand women, can I find one good one? Isn't that real encouraging? <laughs> Solomon, said, <clears throat> Solomon said he could not find one good woman out of a thousand. Well, if you go to a bar looking for a woman, what do you expect? Because that's where he was going, in essence, because he was going to the 
pagan deities of his day. A lot of his wives were these pagan deities. Okay, and so what do you expect? Now in chapter 2, when you read down through, look what this guy did. In chapter 2, verse uh, 4. I made me great works, I built me houses. Now obviously, <clears throat> he didn't do it personally, but he was the architect, overseer. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. Can you imagine studying all those things and making sure you're getting all that right? I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possession, possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold. <clears throat> okay, he brought in annually 666 talents of gold annually. A talent weighs about 100 pounds. Do the math. Okay, in verse 8, <clears throat> the peculiar treasure of kings of provinces, I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that all sorts. When Solomon sat down to eat, he didn't have a CD player and had an orchestra. He had the whole orchestra playing right there. If Solomon and his uh, entourage came in as they're going through communities, they say he came in Lowell, he says, oh, I like Lowell, I'm going to buy the whole town, he'd buy it. I don't know why, but he'd buy it. That's just, that's the kind of guy he was. He had wine, women, and song. Is what Hollywood says, if you get that, you're going to be happy. And they're not happy. Hollywood people are not happy. Okay, and so <clears throat> Solomon is a guy that has experienced all that stuff. And he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. But I know the average person they're not going to believe it unless they check it out themselves. <clears throat> so, check it out yourself. And then you're going to have a lot of wasted time and you're going to find out it was true. That's how it goes. So Solomon had points, <clears throat> points throughout his message all about vanity. <clears throat> and at the end, look in verse 13, he draws a conclusion. He doesn't have a three-point outline in a poem, so forget the poem. And this is what preaching is. It's trying to draw people to a conclusion about a certain topic. Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. <clears throat> Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. There's the right conclusion. Now, I understand it's Old Testament doctrine. <clears throat> but the next verse, But God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So that's the bottom line conclusion. Ecclesiastes is good for Americans. Because the thing that's getting American Christianity is all the distractions we have. That's what's getting us. And a person needs to focus on Jesus Christ and judge everything through him, judge everything through him, okay? And then, then you can maintain a balance that's pleasing to him. Okay, so that's Ecclesiastes. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us. This. Yeah, we, we do enjoy the blessings of this country, but Lord, help us to recognize that those things are convenient, and hopefully that allows us to do a little something more for Thee. And Lord, I pray You'd help us to uh, keep our focus on You and allow You to be the center of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.